So that's the first thing. Like technically, are our skills varied enough? You don't want to have two people with exactly the same skills, at least in my mind, because um, you're kind of then you need to hire so many people early on to fill the gaps between you. Versus if you're two people who are quite broad in their own sense and that don't overlap too much, then um, you can do a lot just the two of you without even starting to hire people. So that's the first thing. On tomorrow's show, I'm talking to Helena Gagan. Helena is a new founder, someone who's going through the program right now with Entrepreneur First and still trying to work out exactly what shape that business will take. And with her, I really want to know what the process is now like in this world where COVID exists and things are slightly changed. What that's like being a first-time founder. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly technology podcast with myself, David Savage, where we talk to leaders from across the industry, bring you a bit of technology news, and it's all powered by the Harvey Nash Group. Joining me today, I've got Akish. Akish, you're in London. I'm at Lisbon. You are. You are. The, modern, the modern wonders of modern technology. It, it is. It is. Uh, yeah, I'm here for Web Summit. I'm here uh, till Friday. And just before I hit record, I was moaning because it took an hour and 20 to get through passports, which I'll be honest, folks, I was going to tell you what opening night was like, but didn't go. <laughs> didn't make I had it. A meeting, I had a meeting at four that got pushed back to five with a lovely chap called Sebastian, who will be a guest on the show. So listen for that later, who's, who's having a look at data and how it can help understand our, our motion so that they can produce better things for kind of sports stars and amputees and bits and pieces. So... Bits and pieces is probably the wrong word to say with amputees. Yeah. Uh, that, that, sorry. <laughs> Take that back. That's, that's awful. Though. But what they're doing is amazing. Um, it was quite funny. I sat down with him at, uh, uh, for, for some kind of what I thought was a coffee and he had absinthe. Brilliant. Oh, wow. Oh, that yeah. Is, I've, I've never been to a website, but is that how it goes down? Does it? You, you meet for, you know, just hard uh, alcohol. <laughs> People, people enjoy themselves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I went, I went, I, I didn't really have anyone to meet up with last night. So I just went to soak up the atmosphere in a bar, t- spoke to a couple of people. Mm. Um, Cause it's very easy to net. Cause obviously everyone's there to kind of like chat to each other. Um, me with me, super block alcohol free. Yeah. Okay. Um, I did message yeah. you. I said, uh, don't be hung over uh, for this on your non-alcoholic <laughs> drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, no, it, that, that is definitely an element of it. I got, got, got back to the hotel and I had a text at 12 minutes past midnight, that midnight, sorry, just saying Pink Street. And I was like, no, no, what, I, I'm not. What's Pink I'm not Street? Going out. Pink, so Pink Street's like uh, one of the kind of the main bar strips. It used to be the red light district and it's oh. been, it's now no longer a red light district and it's quite trendy. Yeah. Um, in a very, to be honest, in a very short itchy way. Oh, right. um, uh, it's very trendy though yeah. and uh, yeah the idea of getting back out of bed having just got into bed like no no there's there's several of the nights of this like, yeah. I'm quite happy having a chilled first evening but yeah, I can't yeah. tell you what happened at Web Summit because apparently we now have to go through non-EU queues I don't know why don't know what that's all about let's not get into that yeah. um, but it was a nightmare thanks <laughs> <laughs> good, to, good to know and I, I feel like I should have some sort of you know, equivalent in terms of story, and I don't really have any. So um, no, no. Well, you have you've not subject, subjected no. yourself to the joys of being uh, going through airport security in an EU country, right? No, not yet. So yeah. enjoy that. Mm, I don't feel jealous. <laughs> Talking of travelling in EU countries, today's uh, guest is Helena, and she's Austrian. And as she alludes to in the interview, I think she's she has just come back from Austria before recording this, uh, where she's part of the latest cohort at Entrepreneur First here in London, or there in London, as I'm currently thinking about it. Uh, so we'll hand over to the interview, and then we'll come back with some commentary afterwards. So this morning, I'm talking to Helena. Uh, thank you for taking the time to chat to us on today's podcast. How are you? Good morning. Um, I'm doing incredibly well. As we just said, the the sun is shining in London, and yep. it looks to be a very nice day. Yes, and, and although you say incredibly well, let's be honest, both of us have slight coughs. So yeah, we do. <laughs> hey, if anyone's listening and there's, you know, we're recording in late October, the kids have gone back to schools. Everything seems to be going crazy. Everyone seems to have a cold. Never mind. <laughs> I feel like um, here in London, almost everyone I know has a cough right now. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just very, not limited depressing. just to us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you are in the current 
founders cohort in Entrepreneur First. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. I joined, um, I think I'm on week five now. I'm not actually that sure. Time seems to pass so incredibly quickly right now. So I'm really losing track of it. Um, some days I wake up, I'm not even sure. Is it like Thursday or Friday? And I, I'm like so panicked that I need to pitch today. And then I realize it's Thursday, so I don't need to pitch yet. So that happens all the time right now. Um, but if, yeah, I've started really recently and um, joined Entrepreneur First as a founder um, from a kind of commercial perspective. And let's see what happens there. And you, look, we obviously are lucky on this podcast that we get to talk to people who have built companies, have scaled companies. But it's also really fun to kind of go back to that origin piece. And I think right now it's important too, because there might be a lot of people out there who, who would love to start a company. And a lot of those traditional incubators and and the kind of the community that you get that surrounds um, a founder and, and, a, and a startup has changed. Um, you know, if you were an entrepreneur first prior to the pandemic, I, I imagine that you would have been in a very busy room, um, in a very busy environment with lots of founders around you, people kind of sitting or having coffee together, sharing ideas. And I, and I guess that's not quite the case now. Um, so actually, at, at Entrepreneur First, they've gone pretty much back to normal, at least here in London. So they run cohorts in Paris and Berlin as well. And I know that when I talk to people over there, they're always wearing masks in the office. Whereas here in London, we're actually all in person. Um, we're about 80 people. Uh, we are socializing tonight. Is at everyone the in? Party. Yeah, right. people are in. I mean, there's no structure to the program, right? So that being said, like if if you don't want to come in, if you're out of work for some, from somewhere else, if you need to stand in front of a movie premiere and talk to people that go out because like you're doing research on moviegoers, then that's totally fine. No one forces you to come into the office. There's certainly no kind of log of whether you're there or not. It's really up to you. Um, but people do tend to come in. I expect a lot of people to be in today because there is there is a like a social event going on. Um, and the COVID effect, like we're very lucky that we're not feeling that as much. I think the last cohort was run entirely online. And that certainly is, is sounds like a lot more pressure trying to find a co-founder, ideate and really build a company from scratch and um, was not even being able to meet up in person. But you have been going through that process in as much as, you know, you, you've come from a non-tech background, you've started um, a tech business. And that is in, you know, with the backdrop of the pandemic and the threat of lockdown, um, it hasn't gone away. You know, with rising case numbers, people are talking about, are we going to get, you know, have some kind of measures reintroduced? So it must be an interesting time. And there will be levels of nervousness from people, right? Some people will obviously want to socialize and get back into, into, into the world, but others may not. Yeah, I mean, it's so true. I think it's a, it's a very kind of individual decision. I think for me, the pandemic has been, yeah, exactly the background of when I switched my career from doing like business development and I studied urban planning at, at university. So I really wasn't technical at all. I always was really interested, but I never kind of knew where my place was in it. And then I decided to to quit my job that was in LA at that time and come back to Europe and um, learn how to code. And actually, when I when I quit my job, I flew to Costa Rica on that day. And um, that was when COVID was starting to break out. That was when all the things with that cruise ship happened. But I lost my phone in Costa Rica and I thought, oh, fantastic, <laughs> digital detox. <laughs> I'm just going to switch off for a bit. And 10 days later, I'm back at the airport and my visa had run out, my work visa, but I was planning to enter the, back into the US on my ESTA to like wrap up my life there and then move back to Europe. And I'm at the airport without a phone. And um, yeah, they look at my passport, they go like, you can't enter the US. And I say, why? I can enter on an ESTA. And they say, well, President Trump has suspended all Estes because of the pandemic. And I had to do a lot of catch up on what's going on in the world. <laughs> and also I had to like somehow get back to Europe without um, even touching down in the US, which was actually very hard. And then my, my whole journey into, into tech was like remote. So I learned how to code remotely on a bootcamp that's normally in person. Um, I think for me, I just tried to make the most out of it. And the pandemic for me was a time of like obviously worry and all of that. But like on the on the positive side of it, I got this focus time in. Like, you know, I couldn't couldn't socialize. I couldn't do anything else 
or, or even leave the house. So I was like, mm. I might as well go super deep into this coding world and try as best as I can to learn everything I can whilst I am in this like weird situation of lockdown where there's nothing else I can really do. And I have to say in that sense, it kind of benefited me because it gave me that deep focus that you sometimes need um, when you're trying to learn something new. You just need to immerse yourself in that world. And, and that's certainly what I did. So I think like some parts of it, I could definitely see with a, with a positive light, but of, obviously others were, were really hard. And I think right now with everything opening up, but cases rising again, I, I definitely see people treating that in different ways. Um, I've just been back to Germany and even there, the, the mood is a bit different than here, I would say. Like people are, are starting to worry a bit more. So look, if we if we focus in then on that decision to leave a career that you knew that you could have been, I suppose, comfortable and secure in that regard, and to push yourself into this situation where you're trying to build something and it's all highly uncertain. Um, what was the catalyst? What was the motivation for you to go, you know, I, I, I do want to take this risk? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I think for me, I was always so interested in technology. So when I studied urban planning, every essay I wrote was always about smart cities. I just never knew where my place was in that tech world. I kind of felt like, oh, I don't know, like software engineer. And then I saw some other job roles and I never knew what they meant. And I never knew if it was for me or if, it, if I was any good at that. And I kind of had that misconception that I would be really bad at all of these things. Um, so yeah, so it was definitely like a big decision. The way it came about was that I was, um, digging into our data. So this was a European unicorn that, um, expanded to the U S and I was kind of helping them build that market, um, from a business development perspective, but our like customer review scores in the U S were really bad compared to Europe. And one day I didn't have that much to do. So I was digging into our data and just like reading all the comments, which I think normally people don't really have the time to do that. And I was just like doing that. And I realized that so many people were talking about this one specific issue with our app that made them like not be able to find where they need to go. And um, when I realized that, I realized how much of a problem it was. And I made a case for it that we need to change the app. And mm. when I went to the manager of the US with that, he put me in touch with our product manager back in Europe. And I talked to him about that problem. And that was when I realized, oh, wait, there is this guy over there in Germany. Um, he's called a job product manager. He gets to you know do technical things, like decide how things should look, decide like how um, people should experience our app and that digital product. But he's not necessarily writing code. And he's still like talking about things on a very strategic and commercial level. And I saw that and I was like, wow, like that's me. Like that will be me. And then I actually realized I have a good friend who was a product manager at Google. And um, he studied computer science, really came from a technical route. And I was talking to him and I told him that I, I realized that what he's doing is actually really cool because I always just thought like, yeah, Google, cool, whatever, but never like digged into what he was actually doing there. I was like, this is so cool. Can you tell me more? And we spoke for four hours and he told me everything about product management. And after that, I was totally obsessed. And I actually made like a game plan with him in terms of like how I could break into that world. And um, the first thing he said was like, you know, like some people are non-technical as product managers, but like, being able to understand like how code is written and what goes into making a digital product is actually really important. So like the best thing you can do is go back to university and do a master's in computer science. Now I'm a really impatient person. <laughs> so that just sounded, you know, I just had missed the application deadline. So it would have been another year plus another year of the master, like another year until, you know, I can apply and start. And another not to mention the fact years. it's very, very expensive, right? Of course, that as well. And I kind of really loved working. I loved being, you know, being paid for what I was doing. At university, I used to actually pay myself sometimes for studying. So I would to ration my pocket money and then like pay myself the more I study to like kind of get some sort of financial reward out of it. I just like hated just doing it for nothing, even though I was like kidding myself totally at that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I felt like Two years where I'm not going to be earning. Um, that just sounds like very long, especially if I know right now what I want to do. Why do I have to wait? And I was looking for other ways in which to, to get technical. And that's when I decided, okay, the thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to learn how to code on a more practical 
you know, way, which is like a boot camp. It's not so focused on the theory. It's more practical. And then I'm going to build a startup. Um, because when I build a startup, I'm going to show all the companies out there that I have gone from inception of an idea to building it with my own hands to actually launching it and giving it into the people of users out there. And then I know what it takes. Um, and that was my plan. And it worked really well. <laughs> So look, you, you mentioned something quite interesting in that you you delved into the data of the business that you're working in and you found a problem. You then went through that process of going, I want to be a product manager. I want to learn. You're now in a founder's program trying to build a business. How have you gone about find, finding a problem for you to solve now as your own business? Yeah, this is really interesting right now. So at Entrepreneur Fast, it's really about the co-founder relationship. So they're really against like you starting a business alone. They say that it's so much better to do it together. And I wholeheartedly agree. Back then, before I became a product manager, I was doing it mainly alone. And bouncing off ideas, you know, with another person just makes you move so much faster. And it takes a lot of pressure off you as well. So for me, that concept makes a lot of sense. So in terms of the ideation and finding the problems to focus on, obviously being two people means like both of you should be as bored in as possible. So the process that that we're running at the moment, my co-founder and I, is we we took two days to really think about all the ways that we see the future change and the world change in the next kind of five years. Um, so this could be anything. We really came up with things about like the metaverse to telehealth in Africa to all these different things. And then we went through each of one of those ideas. We had probably around like 25 like big visions for the future. And we started looking at, are we passionate about that? Are we the right people to bring that vision to life? Like maybe telehealth, none of us is a doctor. Maybe that's not us. Like maybe someone else needs to go do that. Um is that opportunity big enough? Like, is that a small change that will, that will, you know, change like one small thing, but then it's done? Or is that a vision that will move markets, that will create new markets, that will touch a lot of different industries? And that's how we're kind of ranking all of these visions for the future. Right now we're on six, down from 25, which already feels like a huge achievement. And those six are all pretty exciting. So the next step now is um, getting a bit more into detail on those six, like going off just like talking about it and actually doing some research. So what we're looking at it at right now is like, does this future already exist? Because if it already exists, that's not exciting enough. Um, if it doesn't exist, what types of companies, what types of people are trying to bring that future alive? Are they moving towards that future or actually a different one? Like, will they achieve it, right? How good are they? And um, what, what is currently not explored in that area? Those are kind of the questions we're asking ourselves. Um, as well as like, when you dig deeper into a topic, how how passionate do you really feel about this? I strongly believe that in order to build like, a, a big long-term company that you'll have for five, six, whatever, how many years, um, you really need to have passion for it. And you need to, it kind of needs to connect to your innate skills. Um, you need to be able to talk about that business and that problem for 10 hours at a dinner party without getting bored. Everyone needs to get bored of you talking about that. That's like the level of obsession you need with that problem. Um, so like always checking in with our passion is something that I would say we're doing way more than than maybe other founders out there because we both really want to make sure we end up working on a vision for the future that that is deeply kind of connected with us and that we really, really can't wait to bring to life. So you're someone that you want your friends to turn around and go, oh God, don't invite Helena. She's going to go on about that again. I'm sure that, I'm sure that you'll find enough enthusiasm that they'll find it interesting themselves. Uh, how, yeah. do you, <laughs> how do you identify a co-founder? It's all very well saying you should have a co-founder. It's all very well that being a theory that you can buy into. Entirely different thing actually finding someone that you can bounce off and work with. Yeah, I mean, that's so true. <laughs> I think so. Just a quick background on Entrepreneur First. The whole idea is that individuals join, that you meet other individuals who want to build companies, that you match up with the people who seem to be a good co-founder and then start working with them. That's kind of the whole concept. Um, so evaluating co-founders is something I've done very heavily for the first for the last month. And I've really tried to get good at it, although I'm, I'm not sure like how to even measure that as a framework. 
I think for me, um, of course, like in a sense, I'm looking at, at like technical skills. So I'm quite a commercial person. I can code a bit, but it's very much like a more like an understanding of how digital yeah. products are made than actually being able to execute on that. So I'm definitely looking for someone who has different insight into technology than me and deeper insight. Um, for example, my co-founder right now, his background is in machine learning. And that's definitely something that is a bit beyond kind of what I know about. Um, so that's great. That brings a different perspective to the table. So that's the first thing. Like technically, our skills varied enough. You don't want to have two people with exactly the same skills, at least in my mind, because um, you're kind of then you need to hire so many people early on to fill the gaps between you versus if you're two people who are quite broad in their own sense and that don't overlap too much then um, you can do a lot, just the two of you, without even starting to hire people. So that's the first thing. The second thing is kind of, can that person also challenge me? I think one of the worst things that can happen is being with someone where you constantly agree on everything. Because in a sense, um, my experience so far in life only represents a very small part of the population. And um, if I have someone who kind of also views the, the world in that similar way, then we're probably really skewed toward a very small part of the reality instead of actually considering how, you know, all teenagers experience a certain problem. Um, and that's really important to me too. Then I think the other thing, like the third thing that I'm definitely looking at is personality. Um, there, the things that I've learned to look out for is do I trust this person? Um, I think you probably can't co-found a company without trust, complete trust, like a lot of trust. <laughs> um, and I'm actually looking at fun as well. Um, that is a bit of a niche one. I don't think many people would say that that's one of their criteria. For me, it's a huge one because no one's forcing me to build a startup. I do this because I feel like this is the right path for me and I've always wanted to do it. And it just feels right. But this is also such an opportunity to build kind of the company I really want to build with the person that I enjoy working with. That's really unique. You don't normally get that in your work life because you might get a new manager that you don't like. You don't get to choose. So I was thinking, why not choose um, someone who I actually have fun with as well? And that doesn't mean like, you know, going out together. That just means like when we're working together, does this feel exciting? Do I get up in the morning and go like, oh, yeah, I really want to like go to the office and work with this person. I can't wait to see what we talk about today. That's like the feeling I'm looking for right now. So one last thing I wanted to ask you, um, as we've said, you started this process in a particularly challenging environment where things aren't perhaps quite as ideal as they might have been prior to the pandemic um, or, as, or as easy access, I suppose. You know, you, you mentioned just kind of traveling around the world at one point and kind of being plugged into the world was, 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 was tricky. Um, so if someone else is sitting there right now and they are in a comfortable job, but they think that, that this is something that would excite them. What would you say to them to, to, to be the catalyst to say, you know, go for it, follow, follow, that, follow that path, even if it's not particularly clear? Yeah, I think that is such a good question. I think, first of all, um, kind of check your emotions. Like, how do you really feel about this? Is this more something that feels like, oh, you know, other people are doing startups, maybe I should do it too? Or is it something where you're like, I, I really want to do this? I don't really know why necessarily yet, but it feels like this is the right thing for me. So really check in with your feelings, I would say is the first, first thing. And if you have that feeling, then you can create so much impact in the world. If you go and kind of leave your job now or like at least start a side hustle, the impact you can create through that is just exponential. So I would say to someone who's currently considering this, um, maybe sit down, make a bit of a plan. If, for example, you need to income from your current job, figure out ways in which you can you can build something on the side. Maybe even talk to your manager and say like, hey, um, you know, there's something I want to learn about. Um, could I work four days a week? Obviously, try to be careful with like any non-competition clauses that you might have in your contract. But I would say a lot of companies are actually quite open to letting their employees kind of um, upskill and um, learn about new things. So maybe you can do the first part of the, the entrepreneurial journey whilst you're still in your job and um, start learning about the problem, start catching up on skills if you need any. Um, and then once you feel a bit more certain in the sense of this is the right thing and this is what I want to do, 
I can recommend having a bit of a game plan in terms of, okay, I'm going to take three months or four months to explore this and setting yourself timelines as well. Because I think it's easy to just like think about doing a startup and then just it taking ages. And then a year later, you're like, oh, wait, I, I kind of launched something, but no one's using it. And like, ah, this is, didn't go quite well. I think if you set yourself a timeline, like three months and the three months I want to launch like a first version, even if it sucks so badly that, you know, people uh, can only half use it. I'm going to launch in three months. That gives you a timeline to work with. And that gives you also a timeline to measure um, whether this will work and whether this is worth like pursuing um, full time and long time as well. Well, look, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. It's really fun to get that perspective of someone who's at the beginning of that journey. And you'll have to come back when you've whittled down those six ideas to one. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Hopefully very soon. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll come back and tell you all about that big vision and problem. No worries. Have a lovely day and I hope you feel better soon. Thanks, David. I hope your cough gets better as well. <laughs> so, Keish, what, what did you think? In, in my honest opinion, I, it sounded a bit like Tinder for co-founders and, you know, people looking to uh, that have ideas. And it's like this place which just reminded me of Tinder or like a dating app. And you kind of go there. Everyone's got their own idea of what they're looking for in the future. And, you know, if there's a match and you find people with the same synergy, then you kind of get together and, and you know, see what happens. Um, well, that's, that's quite good, though, in a way. Yeah, does that, is that a fair analogy, do you reckon? Do you think that's fair? I don't know. Well, so Entrepreneur First's whole philosophy is found, as and Helena says this, founding with a co-founder is easier. And she talks about the fact that if you've got two people whose skills don't um, don't really match up with each other, Mm. in a in a complementary way then then it forces you to hire other people in i think quicker mm. yeah whereas if you've got two people who really complement each other that's a really good dynamic and i i've spoken to a lot of founders over the years who do talk about the loneliness uh of of, of this process and that actually having a founder that you can bounce off is really really positive and many people look for co-founders mm. in a non-structured way and all, mm. all ef have, have done is gone Let's let's put let's put a wrap around this. Mm. And yeah, maybe it is a bit Tinder esque. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, it, it, it works, though, right? It works. Um, I'm on about entrepreneurs first, not Tinder. I don't know if Tinder works, but you know. Do you um, not? I've, I've, I'm too old. I missed that one, so I've, I've, I don't even know if it's like swipe. Right yeah, I, no, I, I kind of got onto that, but you know, I think I'm better in 3D version than 2D, to be honest. So. Uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Anyway. I'd, I'd agree with that. Listeners, Akish Diamond. <laughs> right. Uh, but Helena, I like the fact that she talks, you know, it's, when you're founding a company, maybe there's this misconception that you do everything together. Mm. And I have, we've, have, we've have had extreme examples of this on the show. We've had co-founding teams where it's family, brothers, mm. right? But Helena points out that she, she what she really looks for is going into work and wanting to work with that person mm. and i think that's a really nice distinction you don't have to because startups can be all consuming yeah. and if you've got this idea that it's the two of you against the world and that's it no but she still has <clears throat> that slight no no i can still go out and have a separate life to a co-founder where my work life primarily exists and i think that's really healthy at, at an early stage yeah, of course. And I think because it, it must be so difficult just to get consumed by everything. And, you, you know, you read about kind of founders and, you know, the hustles and how they're just 24 seven ingrained into the business and yeah. they can't sleep. And, you know, you hear Tony Robbins going, why are people successful? Because you wake up at four o'clock and you live and breathe. Which is business. unhealthy. Yeah. I mean, my, I mean, I don't know how he's a motivational speaker because some of the things he says are just absurd. But anyway, that's that's another that's for another pod. But I think, yeah, like she said, I, I think it's just healthy and it's just yeah. It, it it also refreshes your mind, I guess, just to come in and have new ideas and new ways of working. Well, and, I think this. I think I'll be honest, right? Let's 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 just quickly dwell on that. I think this whole thing around how to be successful and tips from people who are successful is inherently unhealthy and puts a lot of people probably makes people feel quite a lot of shame like mm. i'm not bill gates i can't read 12 books in a weekend or whatever yeah and i shouldn't be made to feel bad that i can't 
Yeah, exactly. And and I don't think we should replicate our lives on people. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. There's probably some good things that, you know, people that are really successful that they do or that they've done. Tips and tips. Yeah. You know what it's like? You know what it's like? Uh, a few years ago, In Search of Perfection, Heston Blumenthal's first major book on the back of how he made stuff at the Fat Duck. And it's all ridiculous. Like, Chili con carne mm. recipes that take three days and in- include like dry ice and liquid yeah. hash and whatever else. Yeah. Obviously, you can't do that at home, but you mm. could take one or two tips and apply them. You could yeah. go, all right, he puts peanut butter in his chili con carne. Never tried that. Let's do that. Or dark chocolate or whatever. Does he? Yeah, dark chocolate and peanut butter. Well, hang on. So he puts dark chocolate, and I think peanut butter is in like the world uh, champion chili recipe. Oh, Put both wow. in. It's amazing. Dark chocolate oh, wow. in particular goes very well in chili. Anyway, not the point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you you should take like one or two tips. Yeah. And and not definitely not feel browbeaten to to follow just kind of what you read about the uber successful and whatever else. And I think I think Helena's got a really mature approach to this. Mm. I, I, and, I, and I think the way she kind of says it is look, you know, there's definitely a split, and you know, with the, it, it's also the the knowledge. You know, she mentioned something along the lines of. She's not the most technical, but someone that she's, you know, kind of working with at the moment comes from like an AI, um, mm. you know, data type of background, which, again, another reason for wanting to work closely with that person is because she gets to add another string to a bow. Right. And she gets yes. to learn a bit more. And, yes. you know, she gets to she, she gets to learn firsthand, whereas, you know, if you just signed up to like some sort of an online course, you may not get that exposure or that level of knowledge or expertise as if you were working day by day with someone. Yeah. yeah. Although I really like the fact that she's tried to learn a little bit of low level code because it's really mm. useful to be able to have a, a conversation and, and have a basic understanding. She doesn't yeah. need to write the code for her business, mm. whatever idea they tackle. Yeah. But she does want to have a conversation where she doesn't feel like it's alien. Yeah. No. Exactly. So it's that balance. So, exactly. so I think that's coming back to that point four. I think, I think she's doing the right stuff. It'll be very interesting to see where she is in six months and a year. It will be. It will be. And we'll be sure to, um, yeah, to track her. Um, yeah. yeah. And look, we, I know that this podcast often talks to, you know, leaders in Zoom or Spotify or whatever else, but I think there's a lot of people going through this early stage. It's really helpful to hear from from voices who are doing the same. Mm. And I'm sure if, you, if you're feeling that Helena might have some useful info for you, get in touch with her. Yeah. Right. When we come back, we're going to talk about deforestation. A couple of years ago, Michael and Jacob, two friends from London, were both thinking about their consumption and sustainability as a whole. Michael, a professional footballer at the time, realised he had no options when it came to sustainable sportswear. Overconsumption and underuse was all too common. Hilo was born, a sportswear brand fighting for the planet by changing mindsets. They started with a running shoe made with seven natural materials, and the shoe could be recycled at the end of its life. As a company, they've offset their carbon to beyond zero, making them carbon negative. You can find out more about Hilo and support their mission at hiloathletics.com. That's H-Y-L-O. We support the Hilo movement. Right now in Glasgow, it is the COP26. Can't have failed to escape most people's notice. All the world leaders coming together to talk about climate change. And the royal Um, family. Oh, it's the Queen. The Queen's there, right? Yeah. No, the Queen's not no, there. No, no, Prince Charles. Charles to take it easy. Prince Charles, yeah, the Prince Queen's Charles, been told to take yeah, it easy, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. she is quite vulnerable and, and, mm. and little these days. Mm. Um, wish her the very, I don't know why, I sound like a monarchist now, wishing her the best, but, you know, she's a little old lady. She seems nice. I, wish, I do wish her the best. Um, but, yes, <laughs> random diatribe. Um, COP26, um, yeah, all right, not technically specifically tech related but one thing i'm going to be doing whilst we're out here in lisbon is trying to talk to a lot of sustainable uh focused businesses um and finding out what technology can do to tackle the world but i did see overnight that world leaders have agreed to end deforestation which is a bit attention grabbing uh headline it's a huge uh, it's a huge, uh, yeah, it's a huge it's, commitment it's a huge commitment if they manage to pull it off and, and i know that they've put aside a huge amount of money so yeah. Uh, 5.3 billion of new private finance, 8.75 billion of public uh, funding to help restore uh, degraded land. Problem is, there have been agreements like this in the past. It's the first in Venice. It's the first time that countries like Brazil, etc., and those countries who are in in uh, sorry in in Africa have 
of being involved and mm. signed up to it. But it's about getting the money to the right place. It's about making sure that the money does go to, to the aims that it's intended to. And the, the argument, I suppose, has always been for some of those countries, is it you know economically viable? Um, I, I Costa Rica were on... Um, did you see the, the Earthshot Awards a couple of weeks ago? I didn't see them, no, no. So the country of Costa Rica won an award because they have committed to reforestation. And they have said that actually it's it's generating more for their economy now through, I think, environmental tourism and other bits and pieces and, and really being seen as a world leader in that front mm. than deforesting. I, I don't know the exact details, but if you go check out the, the Earthshot, World Earth, sorry, yeah. the Earthshot Awards, I'm sure it'll have more details on it. And it was really interesting that they had said that the economic benefits of reforestation outweigh deforestation. But um, yeah, positive. Positive. It sounds very American, doesn't it? Like, you know, we've got this idea. We're going to end deforestation by 2030. So, oh, you've given yourself eight years to do something that's, uh, you know, quite a big task. But, yeah, I, I guess it just helps that you've got um, countries, I guess you've got countries that are affected, that are being made, I don't know, out of choice or, you know, that don't have any other means rather than other than to, to kind of, you know, cut down their rainforests and trees and that sort of thing. And You've got uh, to give them an incentive. Yeah, exactly. You've got to give them an incentive. And also the, the industries that they are then... Um, you know, kind of servicing or providing to buy the deforestation, they need to be looked after in a way that everyone is happy. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So, Unfortunately, like four and five year cycles in terms of elections means that politicians and, and leaders will always be fairly short termist and think about the economy in terms of the next year or two. And yeah. populations chuck them out of the office if they don't get it. Like everything is set up to be mm. short termist. And, and for those countries, that means chopping things down because we can make money quickly and keep the economy going and give people jobs. Mm. We've got to now take a slightly longer view. But if that's the case, then you have to support some, some developing nations. Um, I mean, it, it's shit it's taken us to this point where, it, where you know, as everyone says, the, the kind of the clock's a minute to midnight. But something positive coming out of that, that summit, and fingers crossed, um, it does lead to real action and change mm. and as i said i'm gonna do my very best uh starting today to get around and talk to some um organizations who who have a sustainability focus environmental focus um from the tech world and see what they can do that will be good how's your um how's your like map thing of the web summit going where you'd like list, already listed out companies that or organizations that you wanted to go and see so 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 i've got the web summit app um and in the <coughs> are lots of people wanting to chat. Mm. So, you know what? I've kept it fairly loose. Yeah. Um, there's one or two definitely seeing, um, but I'm also just going to stick my badge on and have a wander around and, and just kind of take it fairly ad hoc as well. Nice, nice, nice. Well, nice so if you're here and you randomly... Uh, people listen to this, Keish. Do they? Yeah, people have said to me in the app, like, I listen to Tech Talks. And I'm like, do you not mean TED Talks? And they're like, no, no, Tech Talks. I found it because of episode X. And I'm like, oh, shit, that is us. Um, <laughs> have, they, have, they, have they mentioned me yet? If they haven't, yeah. they're mistaken. They're mistaken. So if you, they, if you they're listen just, to They this. just say the podcast. They don't say me. Yeah, if you're in Lisbon and you are listening to this right now, please tell Dave how good of a co-host I am. Thank you. There you go. Here's, here's a little message for him. <laughs> if they've listened to today's show... Yeah, and if you, if you actually mention me saying this to Dave, he will buy you a drink. I've just stopped you. I will, an, al an alcoholic one if you an, want. An alcoholic like, one if you want, but yeah. But as yeah. I said, uh, I had a meeting yesterday where the guy was drinking absinthe. I felt like a right one. Yeah. Like, I can have an Earl Grey tea. Yeah, he will buy you an Earl Grey <laughs> tea or an absinthe <laughs> and, and everything in between that as well. So I did, I did explain. I'm really sorry. I've got a chronic liver disease. I'm not just trying to make you feel awkward. Like <laughs> two years ago, I would have been right there with you. <laughs> oh, man. Right. Uh, Akish, thank you for your uh, time. No and, worries. Uh, fingers crossed. If you're listening and you're here, uh, come say hello. <laughs>